Gentlemen, welcome to the Blood Brothers Podcast. My name is Jeff Bruce, and I'm the founder and host of Blood Brothers Men. Over the past several years, we have pretty quickly, we've become addicted to information. And whether it's news media, which tends to be what I'm drawn towards, social media, YouTube and and YouTube influencers, or your Twitter feed, we eat up information at an alarming rate. And as a result, we are often misinformed and we find ourselves frustrated, agitated, and often enraged. Yet our wisdom is coming in these bite-sized pieces from other people's opinions, opinions that often lack research and even truth. Here at Blood Brothers Men, we want to battle passivity, yet we are passive audience to our, our feeds. And as a result, we're, we're not finding and we're not seeking godly wisdom. My guest today is Brett McCracken. Brett is a senior editor at the Gospel Coalition and author of three books, Uncomfortable, the Awkward, and Essential Challenge of Christian Community, Gray Matters, Navigating the Space Between Legalism and Liberty, and Hipster Christianity, When Church and Cool Collide. Brett also has a book coming out next February 2021 called The Wisdom Pyramid, and this is our topic for today. How do we find wisdom, and what should be our sources for wisdom? Brett and his wife and his son live in Southern California, and he's a pastor at Southland Church. Guys, take the time today to listen to this one from beginning to end. I promise you won't regret it. Here's my conversation with Brett McCracken. All right, Brett, welcome to the Blood Brothers podcast. Uh, Definitely an honor to have you on, just kind of discovered you maybe, maybe a month ago. Um, and uh, I guess maybe if you want to take a couple minutes and give an intro about, um, you know, share some of your background, maybe how you came to be an author and a writer for the Gospel Coalition. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much, Jeff, for having me um, on your show. So yeah, I just, I'll be quick. Um, I'm a Christian. I grew up in the Midwest, so I have a Kansas City hat on right now. So repping the Midwest. Um, I live in California now, and I have lived in Southern California for um, about a decade. But um, I grew up in a Christian home, and I've always been interested in both um, Christianity and the church and uh, also culture. So I was always super into like movies and books and music growing up. So really the intersection of those two things has been my life's pursuit, just trying to kind of find a way to have those areas in better conversation with one another and not kind of in these, uh, not in like this antagonistic way that typically happens where the church is pit against culture and vice versa, Mm -hmm. the the culture wars idea. Uh, not Not that there's never a place for that, but I've just been interested in like finding that that area of uh, natural conversation. So I got started as a film critic in college at Wheaton College, uh, which is a Christian university in Chicago. And um, so I was writing film reviews for the student newspaper. And, um, and yet I had to do it from like a Christian evangelical perspective a little bit because it was a, you know, Wheaton College. So that really forced me to think about like, how do I look at movies like in any movies, I wasn't just reviewing like Christian, you know, veggie tales type things. I was Mm. reviewing everything that was coming out of Hollywood. How do I do that from a particular, you know, Christian standpoint in a way that's thoughtful and intelligent and not just counting the curse words, um, you know, and pointing out the, the violence and sex and whatnot, but also just the themes and where does God show up in these narratives of pop culture and what what are the underlying theological assumptions that um, are being made in, in the art and culture of our day? So that's kind of been kind of the question that I've wanted to explore in my writing. And I've, I've since become, uh, well, I was a film critic for Christianity Today for a number of years. And then the Gospel Coalition um, hired me in 2017. So almost three years now, I've been full time as the arts and culture editor for the Gospel Coalition. So it's a really perfect job for me because the gospel coalition if um if your listeners don't know what that is it's a it's a website it's kind of like a journalistic uh website with articles and videos and podcasts but it's 
passionate about the church. So it's passionate about, you know, supporting the church and, and strengthening the church, but also helping Christians um, apply the gospel and theology to all areas of life. So mm -hmm. everything, including, you know, movies and art and music and, and the stuff that I uh, focus on. So that's what I do in my day-to-day -day job and written some books along the way. And we'll talk about kind of my most recent project, um, The Wisdom Pyramid, which is going to be my next book. But that's kind of an introduction Great. to who I am. Yeah, and I looked up, uh, I kind of, I didn't know it was, um, well, I kind of gathered from looking at your articles that it was arts and culture, uh, but definitely found some great reviews, found some new uh, movies. I started watching The Chosen from a, uh, oh, yeah. from one of your, yeah. your articles. Surprisingly I, good show, yeah. Very, yeah, it was really good. Um, I think my wife has a playlist now that she found from, from one of your articles. So. Oh, good. Mm. So listeners should definitely uh, check that out if you're into um, arts and movies and music. Definitely some good stuff there. Good. So, um, so I first I first found Brett. I first found you going uh, just kind of scrolling through the Canvas conference, uh, some of the teachings, some of the videos on YouTube. Um, and for those who don't know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the Canvas conference is geared towards um, art and musicians and integrating faith. Um, I believe it's put on by Humble Beast. Is that right? Or the um, yeah. Humble Beast, Humble Beast and Western Seminary in partnership. Okay. All right. And, um, and so, yeah, I heard you speaking about the Wisdom Pyramid, which yeah, we'll get to here shortly. Um, yeah, and I think I, I mentioned earlier, I didn't realize you're the author, the author of so many books, but, uh, and I'm looking forward to definitely checking out, I didn't know there's going to be a book for the Wisdom Pyramid. So that's certainly something we're going to, to push once, um, once that comes out next year. Um, but let's start with what, just kind of going back to your history, what uh, drew mm -hmm. you towards being a writer? And is that something you even planned on or that just you kind of stumbled on? Um, mm -hmm. you know, something you had aspired to or, or just happened? Yeah, I mean, it definitely was an aspiration growing up. I remember, uh, you know, I had a few like dream jobs as a kid, like architect was one of, one, was one of my dream jobs. Designer of roller coasters, I think, was one of my dream jobs. Wow, right. But um, <laughs> writer was another one. And um, so, yeah, from a young age, I loved books and reading and writing. And so um, it really has been a blessing that, that my vocational path has, has followed that, um, that dream, that aspiration. And, you know, how it came to be was just um, getting experience doing it. And I often tell students, um, like college students, I, I sometimes teach classes at Biola University um, and um, journalism classes and film classes. And I, I just encourage, you know, young people like um, be persistent and, and, and just getting experience doing the things you love. And in my case, I, I had jobs where I was writing, but it was like marketing writing or PR writing. And that wasn't like my dream form of writing, but it was still writing and it was still practice and it was still honing my craft as a writer. So, um, yeah, so I, I kind of do have my dream job now. Like I would describe uh, what I do for the Gospel Coalition is really the perfect fit for me and I'm so fortunate, but, um, but I'm 37 and I didn't, you know, I didn't have my dream job at 22 right out of college. Mm -hmm. So you just gotta have a little bit of grit and a little bit of endurance. And, you know, I worked for free for a lot of time I would submit my articles to different magazines for free and, um, you know, working at a coffee shop to pay the bills, but you got to do what you got to do. And so anyway, that's, yeah, that's a little bit of the path to becoming a writer. Yeah. Yeah. That's some, that's some great wisdom right there for, for people, especially young people to hear as well. I didn't, I didn't get my dream job till I was 40. <laughs> Um, yeah. but, but a lot of, you know, in, in retrospect, you look back and you see all those experiences mm -hmm. and how God uses those uh, totally. to where he's bringing you. Um, Absolutely. Now I've, I noticed with, uh, so you have the three books out right now, correct? Yep. Three released already. Yeah. Now there seem to be, um, just from just looking at the, uh, uh, the overviews of them, a connection between church and culture. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what's kind of your interest there? What, what were you noticing that, um, and if you need to go through each book, but just generally speaking, I guess, yeah. what was the connection you saw that you needed to address issues between the two? Yeah. I mean, I think part of it just goes back to what I said 
about growing up with those two kind of loves. Like I was a church kid. I loved the church, but I also loved culture and the movies. And, you know, I didn't feel like they often were worlds that connected, you know, and if they did, it was usually a contentious um, relationship. So I think that that's just a big passion of mine is to have the relationship between church and culture be healthier, more robust, more generative, not only contentious. And again, I do think there are times and places where the relationship between the church and the culture should be contentious because the culture is definitely going in some dangerous directions. So I'm not saying there's never a place for that, but there's also a lot of good, true, beautiful things being made by artists, you know, secular artists in the culture. And it's, I think it's a good thing for Christians to be able to recognize that and praise those things, um, but also critique what needs to be critiqued. So it's a balance. And um, Mm. I have seen in my generation of, of kind of Christians who maybe grew up in a legalistic environment towards culture, where it was mostly viewed as um, bad and kind of something to be feared. I've, I've seen this thing where the pendulum swings to the other extreme. And it happened a little bit to me in my 20s, where I, I didn't want to be known as a legalistic Christian. So then I swung to the extreme liberty end of the spectrum, where I was basically like, everything is okay in culture, and we can watch anything in whether it's, you know, I don't know, just like R-rated, filthy content or explicit music. What, like, it was like fair game. Everything is fair game. And I don't think that's helpful either. And in, in, my, in my 30s now, not to say that I'm like, I've reached the pinnacle of maturity, but I feel like I've come to a more um, moderate space in the middle where I think it's healthy as Christians to be engaged in culture and to be praising what is praiseworthy about it but also to be cautious and also to be sober minded about the fact that there's a lot of damaging stuff in our culture a lot of messages that are deeply problematic that we need to engage from a critical point of view and i think it's a, i think it's possible to do both so in my work at the gospel coalition i try to model both of those things like when i see some great movies or music that's being made in in a secular environment that actually in spite of itself speaks truth i call that out and i say look here's truth that we need to celebrate but when i see a movie that has a very dangerous false message even if it's a movie that critics other critics praise and say you know this is an academy award you know worthy film like i think it's important that christians can see you know the truth of of the messages so Mm -hmm. yeah so that's kind of why i'm passionate about the relationship between church and culture so much is at stake in that relationship i think our witness in the world um in large part depends on how how we are either shaping the culture or the culture is shaping us um and a, a lot of times i see the the culture shaping christians more than they are shaping the culture and that's um discouraging to see Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, it's actually a a perfect segue because I think, um, I can kind of relate to, I grew up in a Christian home, became a believer when I was 18. And, uh, it's, it's kind of funny because I, I grew up in New York, Long Island, New York, and then, uh, moved down to Florida for, for seminary and seminary was actually where I certainly didn't give into the culture, but the legalisms that I grew up with Mm. were, um, (laughs) I was seeing from fellow professors and students, how legalistic I was. Um, and uh, I think my wife and I kind of had that pendulum swing the other direction mm-hmm. a little bit because we're like, man, where, where is the legalism and how much have we been doing it? And then how much are we dipping our feet too yeah. much into culture? And that really is where, where wisdom is needed. And I think now yeah. that was, that was when the first cell phones came out, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, and now I think mm-hmm. that is a, uh, you know, mm-hmm. we can, we can drown in, in the culture without even realizing it. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great segue to, to the wisdom pyramid. And um, now I'll, I'll add to that. I was a, a health and phys ed major. And so I was very familiar with the food pyramid. Oh yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I remember years later mm-hmm. realizing how upside down that was. Um, mm-hmm. 
and uh, and that's something that kind of caught my attention. And that's that is kind of mm. part of what we do at Blood Brothers, but it's kind of minimal mm-hmm. the, the health and fitness side. Um, yeah. That's but yeah, great. why don't you kind of walk us through um, the Wisdom mm-hmm. Pyramid as as best you can without giving away yeah. the whole book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So yeah, the the Wisdom Pyramid was originally just an, a visual aid that I used in that that Canvas conference presentation in 2017. And it's basically inspired by the food pyramid in terms of that concept of a healthy diet is balanced. It's, it's about the right proportions of um, intakes. That, so in the same way that the food pyramid was about being healthy bodies because we have a balanced diet, um, the wisdom pyramid is about paying attention to the sources of things that are coming into our minds and our souls and making sure that things are in a balanced, um, you know, proportion so that we're not only getting quote unquote wisdom or information from like social media, which I, I put social media at the top of the, of the wisdom pyramid, which is basically the, the dessert category of the food pyramid, the, Mm -hmm. uh, the fats, oils, and sweets category use, use sparingly, you know? Um, so at the base of my wisdom pyramid, and I can just quickly go through, um, the, the layers, so the base of my wisdom pyramid is scripture, because I think that it's, we all know it, and it's kind of a little bit like telling Christians, eat your broccoli, right? Like, we all know the Bible is the most important source of truth we have, because it's God's own word. But I think functionally, uh, in our habits, in our lives, so many of us Christians don't treat it that way. We, it's almost like we know it's the most important source of wisdom we have at our disposal, but we we start our days and we finish our days usually on our phones right even like having written this book and believing this wisdom pyramid i find myself struggling every day to like i my instinct is to look at my twitter feed first and mm-hmm. and to read scripture only you know half hour later while i'm having breakfast so i think it's just um we just have to constantly be reminding ourselves that the foundation of our truth the foundation of any sort of objective truth comes from God, right? He is the only standard. He's the only source of reliable objective truth in this world. And so if, if the word, if scripture is the word of God, if, if we believe that it is the, you know, the only thing we have that is like God speaking directly to us um, in, in an infallible way, um, then of course we have to make that the foundation of our, of our diet. So um, reading it more, being more familiar with it, studying it, making sure that we don't use the Bible to kind of justify our existing opinions and our existing politics, but actually letting the Bible dictate those things. And that's a thing that I really focus on in the book, in the Bible chapter is so often people hold up the Bible as this prop that is basically used to justify whatever they want to justify. But actually the Bible needs to shape us more than we kind of make the Bible into whatever we want it to be. So, so that's part of what it means to put the Bible at the foundation of your wisdom pyramid. It it is both the standard and the kind of check and balance against everything else in your Mm -hmm. diet of information. Yeah. That's uh, that, that mix of those two is, uh, I'm sure you know, but is is all too common is mixing the social media with scripture, um, mm-hmm. whether it's whether it's proof texting or just like I have something to say. Let me find a verse. Yeah. Let me just search the subject and see what verse comes exactly. up and throw that out there. Um, yeah, which is uh, can be just as damaging as your own totally your own words. Mm-hmm. And so many Christians are so biblically illiterate; they just don't have a good grasp of the Bible that they become very vulnerable to these voices that say, you know, the Bible says this and it justifies this political position. And, you know, if you don't know the Bible, you're in no position to counter that or Mm -hmm. say like, wait, hold on. Like, actually that's not representing the Bible. Well, so anyway, I'm a huge advocate of like better biblical literacy, like better catechesis in our church, like training young people to have a better um, grasp of scripture. So we, I could talk forever about uh, the Bible alone. So for the sake of time, I'll move on. But um, so the second le- level of the wisdom pyramid is the church. 
And um, my rationale there is that, you know, the Bible is God speaking directly to us, but the church is God, you know, God's spirit, like moving to form his people. And so Mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's the, the second most important thing for our wisdom because it's, it's God's people. It's, it's his bride, right? That scripture describes this intimate union between the church and, and, and Jesus. So, um, we often kind of disparage the local church in today's world. We even Christians sometimes downplay it and say like, well, I can be a Christian without the church. And, you know, I can just have my Bible at home, um, just me and Jesus sort of thing. Um, but I actually think there's so many reasons why the local church is um, just utterly um, Im- important for our wisdom. And it's the accountability of community. It's, it's a, lo- a lot of what the church is, is it, it provides people who can be mirrors to us, who can call out things in us that sometimes we can't see in ourselves. And, you know, the, at its best, the church is this group of people that are sharpening each other, right? Iron sharpens iron, pushing each other in the direction of holiness and growing together. And it's hard to grow alone. Um, that's a big idea in my book, Uncomfortable which is kind of an entire book about the importance of the local church. But it's this idea that like, you know, being with a bunch of other people um, is uncomfortable and it's hard because there's going to be friction and there's going to be differences of opinion and you're not going to always agree, but it's much better for your growth to to have that accountability. Um, Anyone who plays a sport knows that this is true, right? You're not going to become a great athlete by just, being totally alone and not having any accountability. Like when you're on a team, when you have people who are like, no, you know, get off, get off the couch, you know, you need to like do better and I'm going to hold you accountable to that. Um, that's when we really grow is when we're stretched out of our, our comfort zone. So that, that's some of the, the reason why I think that the church is so important for us. It's a mirror. It's a, it's guardrails. Um, it's, it gets us out of our heads and into, into an embodied kind of tangible local community, um, in a world where social media pulls us like everywhere, except where we are. Like we can, we can fill our minds with all the problems of the world and, and feel like we're more involved in, you know, the protests happening on the other side of the world than we are with the struggles in our own community, a local church community, like grounds us. In a, in a tangible local family. And I feel like that's where most of our wisdom in life comes from the more local communities that God puts us in, whether that's our family that we're born into um, or the church family that we get to choose. Right. Yeah. I like, uh, I'm glad. Um, I like the way you said that. I think, I think when people first, if you were just to, to leave it at, you know, the church, I think our, our initial thought is, oh, you mean the, the sermon? So I get, I get wisdom from the sermon, um, mm. whereas that's, that's just one piece of it. And uh, yeah. I think there's also, which I'm sure I imagine you touch on in, in Uncomfortable, is um, that, that habit that so many of us have is church is either, I mean, there's, there's so many different attitudes, but some just like, I should go to church because I have kids and I don't want them. I want them to have a good moral mm-hmm. foundation. Yeah. Um, right. So let, let me just get in, do my duty and get out of here and never yeah. build the relationships. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know if getting vulnerable is the right, I suppose at some point we don't just jump into that, but we don't, we don't really experience the wisdom of the church unless we're building relationships at the church. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, and that's, I am such a big like um, critic of consumer Christianity where it really is just like the church is this product that you like come on a Sunday, you get, what you want to get out of it and then you leave like the church is we should be giving ourselves to the church and being kind of enmeshed in this this um, group of people's lives Mm -hmm. so that it isn't just us getting something out of it but uh, it's us giving and sacrificing and loving and growing together in community which is messy and hard but it's ultimately for our good right that's great so um, i'll just move on to the next level and tell me if i'm spending too much time on these but um, (laughs) go for it (laughs) i could could talk for hours on each of these so nature um like nature the the environment creation god what he has created is the next level of the wisdom pyramid and my logic there is that um and you're probably sensing a pattern from the bottom up it goes like the most direct 
wisdom from God um, to kind of more indirect, but creation is communication from God, right? He created this, this world. It's his handiwork. The, the Psalms, you know, Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies above proclaim his handiwork. Romans one talks about this, like how there's this wisdom, there's this knowledge that we have of God just by virtue of what he has created Mm -hmm. in the world, in, you know, in the trees, in the mountains, in, uh, in our bodies, in, in human bodies, which is part of nature. So um, there's huge wisdom to be gained from paying attention to that, from not cutting ourselves off from that. Um, And I actually think that um, one of the reasons why um, our society seemingly is becoming rapidly less wise and more foolish is because of the digital age and how it is distancing us from the physical material reality of creation of nature right Mm -hmm. like when we live most of our lives through screens and this virtual space of social media or whatever it can be easy to just start to think that reality is in our heads it's just an it's just ideas that kind of um, are in virtual no man's land uh, and, and it, it, it disconnects us from the tangible reality of the rose bush I'm looking at, at out my window and the squirrel and the birds and like the reality that God has put in front of us these things to speak truth to us if we're if we're paying attention the problem is we're not really paying attention and we're not you know <laughs> Uh, there's all these studies about uh, me- how mental illness is exacerbated when you're not spending time outside and how there's, you know, more and more like doctors and um, therapists are kind of prescribing nature to their clients for their kind of mental health. And I think that that speaks to the, the way that our souls are healthier when we're, when we have a steady diet of nature and when we're, when we're just more aware of the rhythms and kind of the reality of God's created world. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the nature idea. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Not to not to oversimplify, but um, during this uh, you know this time we've had we've had twelve weeks at home. Um, yeah. And uh, so my wife, my wife's a teacher. She's been teaching from home, and she loves when something. We don't really have a big yard, but she loves when something nests in our yard. And so we had <laughs> we had a. Uh, uh, morning doves um, in a planter hanging out there and and rabbits in the back. And my thought is, you know, you can, like I posted some pictures of them. And uh, my thought is if somebody, my neighbor posted pictures, I'd be like, oh, that's nice. And you just kind of glance at it. But when yeah. you see it, you stop and you're just watching every move. Um, or you just even like a sunset. People post sunrises and sunsets all the time. But they don't right. just stare at their phone for a half hour. Whereas... Right there's something about being there and just appreciating it without, yeah. without anything else. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, I grimace when I see people like, um, you know, in national parks or in nature and they're more concerned with like getting a, a pretty picture of, of nature to like post on social media than they are with like just being present with right. You're right the there. nature <laughs> and letting, letting it just do to you what it's supposed to do to you. So, mm-hmm. um, part of what I talk about in the nature chapter uh, and also in the beauty chapter. So this can segue to the beauty as well is just the importance of stillness and how so much of our wisdom comes with slowing down in a, in a world that's increasingly hectic and fast paced. And we're, you know, we're going crazy on Twitter about this thing today, but tomorrow we'll forget about it and there'll be something else, you know, the way that the, the pace of the news and technology moves uh, it's not conducive to wisdom because it doesn't give us space to really consider things deeply and to wrestle through. So um, one of the gifts of nature and beauty is to just like, it kind of, it forces us to be quiet and to just sit still and take it in and to, to kind of let um, the beauty of God's creation just um, speak to us and, and, and puts things in perspective, you know, during, during the COVID shutdown, my wife and I, we needed to get out of town. So we, we took our little one-year-old son and we went to Utah and rented a house in like the desert in this totally remote area. And um, we turned off social media and we were trying to just disconnect from the craziness of our world. 
and it, it was just a good reminder that this is like it's good for the soul it's I, I had some some of my like best thinking you know I was able to do on that vacation just because I had space I had space to like have that perspective where um, I wasn't being dictated by the whims of the social media moment you know mm-hmm. I was able to think big picture and, and, and wrestle with things in a deeper way. So that's just so important for our wisdom is to kind of push against the grain of the pace of our culture that doesn't allow for reflection. Um, so much of wisdom comes from that, that reflective um, pace. So, right, um, so I talked a little bit about beauty, so I won't say much more about that, but um, I think the big thing with beauty is that it, it's, um, it's superfluous so it doesn't it doesn't um, we live in a very pragmatic kind of utilitarian culture where we have to fill every moment with something useful and i don't think that's conducive to our wisdom i think it's the whole idea of having space having breathing room and beauty really helps us to to do that because you know it's not a, a, a beautiful symphony you know by beethoven is not there's nothing about that that's utilitarian like it doesn't like we don't need that, but that's exactly why it's good for our wisdom to right. sit still and listen to that symphony. Um, it's, it's why, you know, reading novels is good. You know, like I think a lot of Christians can be prone to like only read nonfiction because life is too short and we need to like, <laughs> we need to know, you know, five steps to do this and do that. And we need yeah. to, you know, I, I feel, um, guilt, I feel guilty reading fiction yeah. sometimes yeah <laughs> exactly no i do too and and i'm i have to justify that to myself as well because there's so many good nonfiction books on my list but um, i on this vacation in utah i read a fiction book intentionally just to kind of be in that space of kind of superfluous not not utilitarian and it was like the the most profound experience like i as i read this novel i was making all these connections in my head about existence and truth and beauty and um and yeah i didn't expect that um because there was nothing about the novel that going into it i was like i'm going to get you know these three things out of it um but that's what beauty does it surprises us with with the insights and the epiphanies that we're able to have when we give ourselves the space to just experience um beauty so um so that's beauty um and then i have a, a section on books um, and I, I really loved uh, writing the chapter on books in the in the Wisdom Pyramid um, because I'm a bookworm. I love books. I think that there's so much value, um, especially in a social media age, um, to read to reading books because they give us context. And like a tweet doesn't give us context. And so all these discussions happening in 140 characters they just don't have a lot of nuance and they don't have a lot of complexity because they can't because it's, it's such a short space. So, but if you read a book, you are able to do a deeper dive, right? You're able to like, again, take a slower pace. So um, to read a book is an investment of time. It, it takes, you know, days, weeks, months, perhaps to read a long book, but that's precisely why it's good for our wisdom because it allows us to wrestle with, an author and their ideas at, at a longer um, duration. And, um, and I think books also help us make connections uh, in, a way, in a world that's so fragmentary and so much of what comes at us in our social media feeds is so disconnected. Like you'll, you'll see one person post about this and the next post is about you know, a funny cat video and the next post is about a police shooting and it's like all these things are just jumbled together and we don't know how to make sense of it mm-hmm. and our brains just get tired and our brains there's there's interesting neuroscience happening right now studying the effect of the digital age on brains i talk a little bit about that in the book but when your brain is constantly being kind of um, stimulated from so many directions of with random bits of information it it's forced to go into this like constant state of triage where it's like filing. Okay. This seems important. So I'll file this in one area of the brain, but this doesn't seem important. And when your brain is constantly in triage, it gets exhausted and there's no room left for deeper thoughts. And so that's what scientists are finding is that 
the brain's ability to function on that deeper level of reflection and connection and synthesis, we're losing that ability. Um, scientifically proven, like our brains are being rewired by the digital age. So that's why books like get off of the internet, get off of social media and read books. Like, you know, in, in an issue like the, the race issue that's currently in our culture, um, you know, I think it's so much more helpful to get a few good books, maybe on different sides of the debate, and just spend your time reading those and, and really wrestling with the arguments in those books rather than, you know, spending all day every day just like seeing a million opinions on social media and not having any ability to like make connections um, mm. there. So I think books are good for making connections and making um, empathizing with others, like in a world where we're losing that kind of ability to, um, to understand each other, right? Like, like who, people who are different from us, um, reading a book by someone of a different um, background is such a good way to just realize this is a human being and they're coming from a particular place and I don't have to agree with them on everything, but listening to them for an extended period of time in reading their book is an act of love. And as Christians, I think called to love our neighbor, that's mm -hmm. one way we can do that is by giving them our time and listening to what they have to say. And again, listening doesn't mean agreeing. And that's some, sometimes lost on Christian audiences who think that just to like um, listen to someone who is, you know, coming from a different perspective means we endorse what they say. It's not true. Um, and I think that that that's like one of the big things that is a test of wisdom. I find a wise person is someone who has the ability to entertain a thought without agreeing with it mm -hmm. and to like, and to have like that intellectual openness to learning from someone without learning without agreeing with everything they say it's uh, it's possible to do that it's possible it's possible for a republican to read something a democrat writes and to learn something and to maybe agree with some of it but also vehemently disagree with some of it it's possible for you know a, a calvinist to read something by a, an arminian and find a lot oh, of insights know, about god <laughs> <laughs> right yeah like that's that's going too kidding. far i know so anyway you get what i'm saying so yeah, i'll stop yeah. there i wonder if um i don't know if you have any insights i'm just kind of thinking how i imagine i don't know any science on this but i imagine it would be difficult for and it's not necessarily an age group but any individual who whether they realize it or not are addicted to social media i wonder if mm. it's um if it's hard work if it takes discipline to become a reader and appreciate yeah. it after sure. just scrolling and reading, you know, short sentences and making quick judgments and opinions to yep. be able to have the patience to learn to sit and read. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's, that's another thing that um, brain research is showing, like um, the social media world that we're growing up in is, is, is reshaping the brain so that it's harder to actually like read at, you know, longer chunks because our brains have been, um, conditioned to like read in these bite-sized chunks and you know tweets so there's a great book um, that I reference in the wisdom pyramid called reader come home it's by um, this woman Marianne Wolf and she 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 kind of talks through a lot of this research and she makes the, the case for why we need to like learn how to read again because if we don't um, if if the next generation just literally doesn't have the capacity to read a book, then that's, we are in deeper trouble than yeah. we ever thought. So I'm a huge advocate for reading and, you know, with my one-year-old son, you know, that's how I, I fill our time together. Let's, let's read some books. Like I want him from a young age to just be familiar with books and not social media. So he, he doesn't have screen time. And I don't know at what point in his life I will allow that, but for now, it's books only, and um, hopefully that'll instill in him the ability and the love of learning in that way. Right. If it, if it brings you any hope, my, uh, my youngest son, um, mm -hmm. I have two daughters and a son. My youngest just turned 14, and he doesn't mm -hmm. have a cell phone yet. He does play video games, oh, good. but he hasn't even yeah. really asked, so we're going to keep that going yeah. as long as we can. Wow, good for you. That's awesome. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I increasingly don't see the benefits of giving kids a cell phone being worth the significant um, downsides. Right. So, right. Um, and I'll end with that since we're talking about cell phones, because that's the top, that's the like dessert, fats, oils, and sweets category of my wisdom pyramid. Um, and yeah, I mean, what I'm saying is not that we should never be online and we should never be on social media. Um, just like the food pyramid is not saying you should never have a brownie or, you know, a French fry. Like, um, it's, it's fine to have those things on occasion. It just needs to be in moderation. It needs to be something that we're very cautious about how much time we um, devote to that. So in the chapter on um, the internet and social media in the book, I kind of go through like five uh, approaches, like how can we approach um, this space of social media and the internet in a way that we get the most out of it in a, we get, we get the kind of kernels of health, the vitamins out of it, so to speak, without the toxic, um, you know, bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> some of the things I talk about uh, are going with um, a plan. So rather than just kind of having that instinct of just opening your phone because you're waiting in line at Starbucks or, you know, you're bored and you don't really have a plan for what you're going to use it for. Like just make it a habit to only use your phone, only use really the internet. Like when you have something you're needing to look for, like only go to Google if you have a sp specific reason to go to Google. Like the, the whole idea of surfing the web, which is kind of this metaphor that, early on in the internet age was that's language that we use like surf the web i just think that's like so dangerous like you don't just ride you don't just ride the waves of the internet these days it'll take you terrible places like you'll get sucked into a spiral of terrible stuff so go with a specific plan um pay, another thing i talk about is just pay attention to the right sources on the internet on social media like audit your, you know audit your feed on facebook and twitter and like make sure you're following you know pretty trustworthy voices um w w when there's things that you could be reading online like don't don't spend your time reading an article that some random person who you don't even know shared on facebook like spend your time reading the articles that your trusted you know pastor shared on facebook or some friend who you really know and you trust their their discernment you know shared so we can easily just like find ourselves clicking on something because the headline was inflammatory and we're, we're curious and unfortunately that's how so many of these internet publishers make money is because they incentivize readers to click because it's like some crazy incendiary headline um but um and, and this kind of connects with your whole thing about passivity, like so much damage is done when we're passive consumers online, on social media, when we just kind of go where the tweets are taking us or where the social media mob is taking us. Like that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Like instead of being passive, be intentional, like only go because you have a specific reason, only click on something because someone trustworthy recommended it. Um, and just be very mindful of not being passive. That's great. Yeah. What, um, so a couple of questions kind of, uh, come to mind and, um, so kind of, yeah, don't want to put you on the spot, but when it comes to, I think what, what I have found myself being tempted with more than anything is the news media. Um, and yeah. now it's, it became, I just feel like it's over the past couple of years. Maybe it's been longer than that, but how, blatantly clearly they're divided and there's no hiding that they're mm -hmm. they're all we know which side we're on um yeah right how how do we how do we get news that's trustworthy <laughs> is it right. looking at both sides or is it just maybe mm -hmm. we just take a step back and say maybe i don't need that much news in my life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i mean i would lean towards that the latter right i i think that we have this um weird sense of expectation and um urgency to like needing to be in the know about everything happening in the news and that that in itself is a form of passivity because we're just we're just feeding into what these news channels want they, they want us to be addicted to being in the know and having to like be aware of whatever the breaking news story is that they're pushing that that hour and 
they they're invested in getting people hooked right like i have relatives like who are news junkies and i just see what it's doing to their their souls and it's um so bad so i don't have news like i don't we don't have tv i don't we don't have cable like i try not to check um news websites very often and i don't have any i don't have any problem being aware of the world like i i somehow it finds its way to me um so i i would just caution people like don't think that you need to like go out of your way to just like check you know whatever cable news channel you check or whatever website like if it's important enough like someone in your network will let you know about it somehow you'll hear about it uh, i just think it's unhealthy as a society when uh, we are so in the business of everyone else in the world like prior to about you know 50 years ago or 100 years ago most humans in history were only aware of the problems close to home in their own family in their own community maybe you know moving outward a little bit to their own nation but they certainly were not aware of the problems on the other side of the world they certainly weren't aware of you know some injustice happening on another continent and not to say that it's not valuable to be aware of some of that and to be angry about it, but humans were not created to bear the burden of every injustice everywhere in the world happening in real time. I think that we were created to be more locally embedded and rooted in a specific place and aware and engaged in the news and the problems that we can actually do something about. I think there's a part of our mental stress in the digital age is that we are hyper aware of grievances and problems everywhere in the world, but 99% of it, we can't do anything about, you know, right. except maybe, except maybe share a hashtag about it on social media in solidarity that we can't actually do much about it where we can affect change is in the local. And surely there are problems and issues of injustice in your own community if you're bold enough to you know look into that and, and try to get involved so um i think that we have more than enough problems locally in our own families in our own churches in our own communities we don't need to be going to national news and international headlines to get angry about everything else right, um, right. that's just my my view <laughs> yeah i like that and i've i found myself um drawn to uh to watching the news at night and um <clears throat> i kind of gave myself a pat on the back because i i watched the office uh <laughs> pretty much from beginning to end instead of watching the news for the past couple of months oh, so you, that makes me feel better you're probably way better off <laughs> just <laughs> I know. in every way because of that decision <laughs> But um, what you're saying reminds me of, I haven't, um, I don't know him that well, but Jordan Peterson has that whole thing yeah. about, um, you know, instead of taking on the world, you know, clean your room first and uh, get Absolutely. your house in order, yeah. which is, you know, yep. I can, it's going to do me no good to show up at a riot and be like, hey, let's not do this. <laughs> um, it's right. better for me to, mm -hmm. to get yeah, my, right. my home grounded. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that far too often, we are hypocrites in that regard and we're we're quick to post an opinion on social media about something egregious happening mm -hmm. in the world but um but our own house is in disarray and not that it's an either or you know i i think that we can and should be um involved both in our local concerns and in kind of keeping our house at home in order and in the um the broader things that are um needing to be addressed but i would focus first on the the local and make sure that that is tended to um and i i i i'm a pastor at a local church so i'm i, I especially have this burden for pastors like i really I, I get sad when i see pastors who are are seemingly more invested in the national conversation and kind of active on social media jumping into the fray and i just wonder like are you as invested in kind of the people in your own congregation and are you having those conversations to me that's where the most of the the burden um, for a pastor should lie is in that local um you know that local community that you're shepherding um so yeah we can do both but we need to focus on that local 
the, the first circle of people that God has entrusted us with. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I got one more question. We could, we could kind of wrap it up with this. Um, I have a question. This is going way back to the beginning of the pyramid. Um, you mentioned scripture and mm-hmm. um, that being, you know, our, our foundation for, for wisdom. And I think what, what sometimes, even if you're seasoned and, you know, been around for a while, that I think the struggle people sometimes have is, okay, read, read scripture. How? Well, like, <laughs> if yeah. there's a summary of how to begin to, um, <laughs> which I don't know if you can do real quick, um, mm. but, but where do people go? Do they just pop open a book? Do they go start a Genesis mm-hmm. and then get stuck at, a <laughs> at numbers? <laughs> um, yeah, what's your recommendation not, or what's your, yeah, what you do? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. And it's not easy um, because we're talking about an ancient document that is far from us. Um, in a, in cult, culturally, there's a lot of distance, and uh, time-wise, there's a lot of distance. So um, it's a difficult book to read. But um, I think there's a lot of resources out there that can make the Bible um, alive and kind of um, more um, more relevant than you might think. So like things like the Bible Project videos, I would recommend. Great stuff. Yeah, um, it's a really well done series of videos on YouTube that kind of look at each book of the Bible, big picture themes, but also just throughout the Bible, kind of um, how certain themes come up. And I think that that is what I would say as one way to help as you read the Bible, like thinking about it as a one big story and and paying attention to kind of the themes, the images, the ideas that keep coming up um, throughout the Bible. Um, So in that way, I think the read through the Bible in a year plans are really helpful and they're hard. And like you said, it's, we can easily get stuck in Leviticus or numbers or some of those books. Um, but I'm, I'm reading through the Bible, um, through the McShane reading plan this year. And it's, it's intense. It's four Bible chapters a day. Um, and you read the whole, um, old Testament once and the new Testament twice in a year. Um, but, um, I, I think it was Tim Keller. I heard someone say like, just advice when you're reading through those plans, like it's okay to just read pretty fast and you don't have to like wrestle with every word and phrase and it doesn't have to be this deep study every day. Like there's value in just kind of reading through it quickly. And, you know, the more you do that with the Bible, the more familiar you are with it. And um, it's amazing what you just, your, your brain will just pick up just from the habit of reading the Bible. Um, So some mornings, if I'm honest, when I read my daily Bible reading, I'm kind of a little bit checked out and I'm like just kind of trying to get through it quickly so I can move on with my day. Um, And I think that's actually okay. Like don't guilt yourself for um, not kind of being super into it every day. There's value in the habit. There's value in just um, immersing yourself in the word of God and seeing what, what jumps out to you. You know, maybe it's just one phrase from a psalm that you read that day that jumps out to you and you never know how god is going to use uh, his word in your your daily life and moment that's good yeah one of the uh it just made me think um i think i've mentioned this before in the podcast but at my nonprofit, at least we uh we use street lights quite a bit mm-hmm. and um <clears throat> i don't that's always great. listen to it i have about a half hour drive to work and back and uh, yeah. I just remember this one time listening to really the whole book of Romans, you know, on my trip there yeah. and back. And I was like, really, I'm not getting, you know, the details, but I saw really yeah. the overarching theme of the book by listening yeah. to it like that. Yeah. Uh, so even something like that could be beneficial. Yeah. Bigger chunks are usually better for, yeah, getting the, the big picture vision. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I love listening to So audio Bible is like big fan of that. Like there were a couple of days during the early moments of the COVID crisis when life was just like so precarious and, you know, everyone was like, is this the end of the world? Like I, I would just go for drives like in my car and turn on my ESV Bible app and I would just listen to the Psalms. And it was so comforting just to like immerse myself in the words of scripture. So um, if you don't like reading it, like listening to it, I think is the same. Like it's, it's God's word speaking into you and over you. And that's yeah. valuable. Excellent. Definitely some, some great information. And uh, I think something we definitely need to be thoughtful of in our everyday lives, especially mm-hmm. with the stuff that we see going on in the world. Um, I yeah. think it's, it's quick to, 
um, one of the things I, I spoke about, I think it was the last episode I did was, you know, mm-hmm. these, all these little issues at the surface going on um, when ultimately it comes down to a heart issue and obviously yeah. not, not everybody is going to hear and listen. Um, but if we can deal with the heart and, uh, and preach the gospel, um, that's going to have a better effect than us talking to people about, um, you know, just, just specific mm-hmm. issues. But. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, that's the thing about wisdom is that it's, um, it makes us more effective in every area of life because what we have to say, how we approach a problem is so much more insightful because of wisdom. And it's not, it's not about the, the more information you have or the more um, data at your disposal. Wisdom is different than that. It's, it's an accumulated sense, you know, it's an intangible kind of posture that, um, yeah, that helps us be better humans and helps us to be better decision makers. Um, so yeah. that's yeah. why it's so important. How can, uh, how can people connect with you and find your books and, and learn more, especially find out when uh, Wisdom Pyramid is going to come out? Um, so it's coming out February of 2021. And I can send you the link of um, the Crossway has a, a little website for the book or just a page that has the, the book cover on it. And you can see that. Um, and then just generally people can connect with me on brettmccracken.com. It's kind of my website where I put all the information about my books and um, latest articles and stuff. Great. Great. Well, thanks, Brett. It was an honor having you on. Appreciate uh, your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciated the chat and love, um, love, love the idea of your podcast. I think it's so good. So important to push back against passivity and every sphere that, that we are challenged by that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Jeff. So there you have it, guys. Make sure you check out Brett's website and certainly his books. And of course, watch for the wisdom pyramid coming out next February, 2021. Gentlemen, we live in a world that desperately needs men and leaders that are modeling godly wisdom. So let's keep the balance right and make scripture our foundation. I know for me, I'll often go to devotional books, which are certainly, you know, very beneficial. But as a result, I find that I neglect scripture and I need to make sure that I keep that balance right as well. But I think what's also important is we need to distance ourselves from social media and the effects that it's having on our minds. So men, thank you so much for joining me today. I always ask you to share the podcast, but this one right now, it really takes priority. So take a moment and share it with someone. I mean, really share it with everyone, someone that needs to hear these truths. And if we can get the balance right, it's going to give us the wisdom that we need to be the men that God created us to be. Thanks again, guys. I'll see you. Lay low, lay low, like the snow's up.